finding it difficult to pray for leaders who have an agenda that is contrary to the Word of God? In his book, How to Pray for the Governing Authorities, evangelist, pastor, and author Stephen Frazier explains how to pray for leaders who don't share the same ideals as you. To receive revelation for our nation that's bringing about a revolution in prayer, call 888-542-2555 and order your copy for only $5.95 or order online at lofbc.org. Is God to blame for the evil things that take place in the world today? Being He is the Creator of all, is He the one ultimately behind the creation of evil? In this new series by Stephen Frazier, the origin and author of evil, you will learn about the goodness of God, the judgment of God, the chastening of the Lord, as well as the creation of darkness. To order the fourth CD teaching series, call 888-542-2555 or order online at lofbc.org. We've been doing a series here on Wednesday nights called The Origin and Author of Evil. Where does evil come from? Where does the darkness come from? And, uh, and we've covered several things, you know, if you just, number one, we looked at the, the Old Testament, the language of the Old Testament. And, you know, a lot of folks, they'll, they'll go to the Old Testament and, uh, to prove to you that God is abusive. You know, they won't actually say he's abusive, but they'll say, well, look, see what God does. And, you know, it says right here, God struck them. God struck them. God afflicted them. And, uh, but see, that's the language of the Old Testament, and if you just, if all we had was the Old Testament, yeah, we could be led to believe that God is an abusive God and he is the author of evil. He's the one behind calamity. He's the one behind the disasters that take place in the world. But we don't just have the Old Testament. We have the New Testament. And the Bible tells us over in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that there's actually a spiritual veil of, that lies over the Old Testament and it isn't removed until we come to Christ. And when we come to Christ, who is in the New Testament, when we come to Jesus, when we're born again and we receive light of Jesus and the New Testament, then this veil is taken away and we're able to understand the language of the Old Testament. We're able to look a little bit deeper and begin to understand uh, what, what the Bible is saying in the Old Testament. And we covered scriptures and we looked at things and we've been looking at things in the Old Testament, the language of the Old Testament to understand uh, you know, that God is not behind the calamities and the disasters and the plagues that take place in this world. So we must always remember to go into the Old Testament with the light of the New Testament. We study, we understand the New Testament first, we get revelation from there, and then we take that into the Old Testament. And then we're able to understand God more fully. Like I tell folks, if you can't see Jesus doing it, don't see God doing it. You know, folks go to the Old Testament, they see what looks like God doing some pretty evil things, you know, afflicting people and so forth. And, uh, but I say, if you can't see Jesus doing it, because see, Jesus was the fullness of God in bodily form, the Bible tells us. And Jesus himself said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so we see throughout Jesus' entire life, he never once afflicted anybody. But rather, he went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed of the devil. That's what the Bible says in Acts 10, verse 38. He went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed of the devil. And so the Bible begins to give us light and understanding that it's Satan who comes to steal and kill and destroy. Someone says, yeah, but you know, God's the creator of all things. And, uh, you know, therefore, you know, if darkness exists then God had to be the author of it. God had to be the originator of it. He had to be the one to have created darkness. But we studied that out also. and We came to understand that darkness has not always been. But darkness began with the fall of an angel by the name of Lucifer. And that darkness isn't actually something that was created. Actually, darkness is a perversion of creation. 
God created light. God is light. And light comes forth from him. God's the one that said, let light be. He never said, let darkness be. He said, let there be light. He spoke light into existence. You say, where does darkness come from? Well, we talked all about this, and you can go ahead online, or you can go into the bookstore, and you can get the CD of it. You can listen to it online, and, and you can see how darkness actually came into being. That darkness is actually a perversion or a twisting of light. That light, light rays actually in the natural can bend. And, and there's a thing out in space called a black hole. How many people remember that? A thing called a black hole. And what a black hole actually does is all the light that goes into it is twisted. It's twisted and stretched and it, and it, so that it no longer looks like light. It doesn't work like light any longer. And it's just dark. And so that's how spiritual darkness, you know, natural things are patterned after spiritual, spiritual truths. And so light, spiritual, uh, spiritual darkness came about the same way. Satan is a perverter. He's a twister of the truth. He twists the light. He twists the good things of God. He perverts them. So darkness is never something that was created. It's just a perversion of light. And so we came to understand that. It's just good to understand that, you know, when you break it down, and that's what we're doing, we're just breaking it down, looking at different things, different subjects to figure out, you know, isn't God responsible for some of the calamity? Can't we give God some of the credit for some of the evil, terrible, dark things that are going on in the world? And unfortunately, we're discovering we just can't do it. We just can't do it. We even talked about judgment, the judgment of God. That even when we're talking about the judgment of God, it's not God's hand coming down on people to afflict them. But actually, the judgment of God is people getting out from under God's hand. Because in God's hand are blessings. There's no calamities. There's no evil in God's hand. There's only good in God's hand. And so you see, when people sin, sin separates you from God. Notice that. God doesn't separate you from himself, but sin separates you from God. And so the judgment of God is experiencing the consequences of sin, which is experiencing that separation from God. And separation from God is separation from good. It's separation from health and wholeness and soundness of mind. And so that's why people experience disaster and calamity and so forth is because they get out from under the hand of God, not because the hand of God is coming down on them. Amen. So the mercy of God is God keeping people from experiencing the consequences of their sin. But the judgment of God is people getting out from under the hand of God and experiencing the consequences of their sin. But still, even when we're talking about the judgment of God, we're not talking about God afflicting people. Amen. It's not God afflicting mankind. And so uh, we've been uh, covering these things. We talked about anger and the wrath of God. And so when it's talking about the anger and wrath of God, you know, we picture somebody having a temper tantrum. We just see somebody with a red face. Just, they're just mad. They're just angry. They're just furious. But actually, it's talking about an emotional response that God has to sin. And what really is that emotional response? Is it him getting red face? No, actually, the anger and wrath of God is talking about God being grieved, deeply pained, and displeased within himself. He's wounded by our sins. Why? Because he sees the kind of consequences it's going to bring upon our lives. Of course, we have examples of that with Jesus. He looked over the city of Jerusalem and he wept over it because he knew of the disaster that was coming. Notice that. His emotional response was weeping over the city, weeping over the people and the things that were going to take place because of their sin. So even when we're talking about anger and wrath, uh, really it's not the best translation, anger and wrath. It's really more grieve. That's what the Bible says in the New Testament book of Ephesians. It says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. It says, put away anger and and loud quarreling and strife and all these things. Why? Because they anger God. Well, what do you mean? They grieve him. They deeply wound him. It hurts God to see you and I fighting with each other. It hurts God. And so God, through his word, is constantly trying to help us. He's constantly trying to help us to live the kind of life that keeps us close to him, in fellowship with him, so we're yielding to him, we're flowing with him, and thus experiencing all that he is and all that he has. And all that he is and all that he has is good. 
It's good. Amen. There's nothing bad in him. As we said last week, there are no, no negative side effects to following him. There are only great, wonderful benefits. And you can read about them over in Psalm 103. Amen. Many wonderful benefits. Well, someone says, what about the chastening of the Lord? The Bible talks about the chastening of the Lord. Have you ever heard of the chastening of the Lord? Well, how does God chasten people? How does he chasten people? Well, when we look up the word chastening, it means uh, education or child training. We're talking about chastening. Education, educating, or child training, which, releases, which uh, relates to the cultivation of the mind to command, admonish, reprove, or rebuke, instruct, correct, nurture. Now, you know, there's the definition of it. And in that definition, I can't find anything that says abuse, afflicts, corrupts, destroys. That's not in the definition of chastening. Chastening means education or child training, which relates to the cultivation of the mind to command, admonish, reprove, or rebuke. Instruct, correct, nurture. Well, does the Lord chasten us? Yeah, the Bible tells us he chastens us. And we're going to read about it here. Matter of fact, why don't we just go there? Let's go to, uh, I tell you, let's start in the Old Testament. Let's see, how, let's look at the Old Testament on chastening first. Go with me to uh, the book of Job. The book of Job. Job 33. And remember that, you know, you really don't want to go into the Old Testament without the light of the new. But we're going to go into the Old Testament. And then we're going to, you know, look at some things. Maybe take them at face value. And then we're going to go over to the New Testament. Amen. And we'll pull it all together and see, see about this chastening. And what the Bible says about chastening. Job 33. Job 33 verse 19. One of Job's friends says, man is also chastened with pain on his bed and with strong pain in many of his bones so that his life abhors bread and his soul succulent food. His flesh wastes away from sight and his bones stick out which once were not seen. Yes, his soul draws near the pit and his life to the executioners. Now, that looks rough, don't it? Oh, man. And so, you know, a lot of folks, you know, they'll come along and they'll grab that. So you say, hey, 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 hey. Right here, the chastening of the Lord. This is how God will chasten you. God will chasten you with a, with a disease. He'll cause you to waste away on your bed. He'll make you sick. He'll kill you. He'll flat out kill you. That's how God will chasten you. How many people want to make God your God? How many people want to call him Father? Thou art my Father. What a wonderful Father. Well, let's, let's come back to it. I'm just going to, I'm going to throw that out there. And uh, we'll come back to it. Notice over in Hebrews. Let's go to Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Because the reason why we put that first is because that's where a lot of people are at. A lot of people believe God will chasten you by making you sick. God will chasten you with pain and suffering. So he says, yeah, we just read it over in the Bible. Well, we read it in the Old Testament, number one. And, uh, and, and let's, go, let's go over here to the New Testament. And let's grab some light, and then we'll go back. And we'll see what it's saying over there. Can you say amen? All right. Notice here in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, in verse 1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. 
Now, the cloud of witnesses that he's talking about there, you know, you got to look over here in chapter 11 for that. Because, you know, the Bible wasn't originally written in chapter and verses. And so, uh, you know, if, you, as we, if you'd go back and read chapter 11, it's talking about all these great men and women of faith and all the great things they did by faith and how now they've gone on. See, they're all in heaven now with God. And it says, see, you know, we have this great cloud of witnesses. See, they stand over the, the, the banister of heaven, you know, and they, they're looking down on you and I. And we're down here running our race, running our race as believers in the Lord Jesus. And they're rooting us on. And we're out here, you know, seeking to live the faith life, the life that they lived. And they're cheering us on. And they're watching. They're watching. The Bible says they are. And, you know, they're not interested in the stuff that's going on in the flesh. You know, they're, they're not looking and saying, oh, look what he's having for dinner tonight. Now, you know, well, look, isn't she wearing something pretty tonight? Well, no, they're not interested in that at all. So don't even sit there and bother about it. Don't, don't stop praying and say, Aunt Margaret. Should I wear this earring or that earring? You know, they just don't care. No, they're not witnessing the things you do in the flesh. They're witnessing the things that go on in the spirit. They're spiritually minded and they're conscious of spiritual things. Even spiritual things that are taking place here in the earth. The Bible tells us, Jesus said, that when someone gets saved, when one sinner repents, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels. Heaven begins to rejoice. Hallelujah. These cloud of witnesses recognize when somebody gets born again. Why? Because it's a spiritual occurrence. And when you and I accomplish things in the spirit, flow in the spirit, see, we've got heaven's attention. Amen. Why? Because God's moving. God's manifesting. God's doing things through us. And so we got this great cloud of witnesses. Somebody say, I'm being watched. That's right. You've got surveillance cameras all around you, man. You better watch yourself. You know, live right. God's watching you. Not only God, but you've got a whole bunch of folks that are watching you. And so he says here, let's just read it again. Therefore, we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin... The sin. Now, a lot of folks don't want to talk about sin. Isn't that right? I mean, there, there are churches today, you know, they're, they're just too beyond that now. You know, you know, you know sin, you know, that subject of sin is not relevant to today's language, you know, to American life. Now we just talk about, you know, you know problems and we need counsel and things of that nature. And, uh, you know, people have got, you know, it's a medical issue. And so we, we've got a drug for every sin now that people commit. So a lot of folks don't want to talk about sin. A lot of folks don't appreciate it. Uh, you know, if someone, you know, gets up in their face and points out they're not living right. There's some changes you have to make. That doesn't work with God. Hello, somebody. There's folks, they don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear that. They, they draw back from that. But the Bible says it anyhow. It says... Therefore, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Thank God. We can do it. He wouldn't tell you to do something you couldn't do. See, you can't do it in your own strength. But you see, by the might and power and strength of Almighty God, that by the greater one that's on the inside of every born-again believer, there's nothing that's so great, so heavy, that you can't lay it aside. I said, there's nothing so great, so strong that you can't lay it aside by the ability of God. If you call on the name of Jesus and learn to yield to his spirit and his power that dwells in you, you can overcome it. You can lay it aside. You don't have to be a slave to it anymore. Amen. And so Jesus, his spirit living in you and I gives us something called self-control. I like having control of myself. Amen. And when you get control of yourself, don't stop there. Get control of the devil. Put him under your feet and keep him there. Amen. And keep, keep the control. God gives you the control. When you make Jesus the Lord of your life, when you put him in control of your life, he puts you in control. He gives you control. And it starts, number one, with self-control. Hallelujah. Somebody say, I can do it. You can lay it aside. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. There's nothing you can't lay aside. And so here he's talking about lay aside the sin. Let's put away the sin, church. That's what he's kind of saying. He's preaching, right? He's preaching. It's written here in the Bible. Let's put away the sin. Let's get it right. Let's repent. Let's get right with God. Let's put these things aside. Let's run the race that's set before us. See, some folks say, ooh, that's convicting. Ooh, that's convicting. Let's lay aside the sin. Why is he talking about sin? Talk about prosperity. Talk about how God will supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. 
Well, let's get the sin out. <laughs> hey, man, let's get rid of the sin. Let's lay aside these things. That's the point why I'm emphasizing this. Because notice what he goes on in verse 5 and says. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Notice first, verse 1, he's telling us to do something. He's saying, lay aside the weights and the sin. Now, if I walk up to you and say, sir, you need to put the sin away. You need to put the sin away. How people know that's, you know what that is? That's the chastening of the Lord. Because that's what, it's in, in its context, that's what he's saying. Just take it in its context. He's saying, lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. And then he's turning around and he's saying, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My sons do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Verse 5. That's the chastening of the Lord. It's him rebuking folks of sin. He puts encouragement in there as well. You know, in verses 2 and verses 3, he's saying, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finish of our faith, you know, for the joy that was set, consider the suffering that he endured from sinners and all the persecution that he endured. I mean, you know, you've not resisted, you know, uh, you've not resisted sin to the point of shedding blood. You've not resisted temptation to the point of shedding blood like he did. Look unto him, and he's in you. And if he can resist sin, you can resist sin too. You can do it. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Hey, Amen. You don't have to be a victim to sin any longer. And so he encourages us with that exhortation. But then he goes right into, don't despise the chastening of the Lord. That's God's chastening you. When, when, when you're getting rebuked, when you're getting corrected for things that aren't right, that's God's way of chastening you. That's how he chastens us. He doesn't chasten us with pain and affliction. He chastens us with his word. With his word. That's how God chastens us. Let's look at this. He says, first of all, in verse 1, he tells us to lay aside the weights and the sin. He, the Bible doesn't say he's going to beat it out of you. Well, you know, I couldn't do it, so God broke my arm. So I wouldn't be able to do that anymore. No. Well, God's just a humble in me because, you know, I've lived such a prideful life. <laughs> and now I'm on this bed of suffering. <laughs> I, I, it was things I just, I wouldn't put away and I wouldn't stop. And so God's, God's forcing it out of my life. One way or the other, he's going to get it out of my life. Even if he has to kill me. No. It says, you lay it aside. And a lot of folks go around saying, you know, God's just a humble in them. You know, by uh, keeping them poor. God's a humble in them. By causing them to not have a job at Christmas time. God's just a humble in us. He was causing us, you know, to be, you know, to suffer in life. Really? That's funny. The New Testament says, in fact, it says it over in 2 Peter. It, it says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Humble yourself. You know, the New Testament tells you, lay aside the sin, lay aside the weight, and humble yourself. And if you don't do it, guess what? It ain't getting done. You're the one that's got to do it. God is not going to do it for you. The Bible doesn't, it doesn't say anywhere in the New Testament where God's going to humble you. Where God's going to force sin out of your life. No, God's encouraging us. He chastens us by encouraging us, exhorting us, rebuking us. 
1 Peter 5, 6 was the scripture. Notice verse 5 here in Hebrews. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked. Well, rebuke is a verbal thing, isn't it? A rebuke is made up of words. You're rebuked by him. God's chastening you is him rebuking you. Well, see, that fits with uh, over in the book of Timothy. Timothy, let's see, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Hold your place in Hebrews. We're coming back. Go, to, uh, go back to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're getting to know the character and nature of God. It's about time, folks. I mean, I mean folks, we, need to settle, we need to be settled on this. There can't be any doubt about these things because if we think for a moment that some of the evil things and calamities and sicknesses and perversions and terrible things that are coming upon people's lives could possibly be his judgment or could be possibly be, you know, because God's hand's coming down on us. It could be because he's chastening us. It could be because he's trying to teach us something. If there's any of that in our minds... See, then we're not going to be able to be in faith to be able to receive deliverance from those things. Because that will provide just enough doubt in us to keep us from being able to receive the blessings of God and the deliverance of God in our lives. I mean, I'm just so convinced through the scriptures of what is God, what is of him, and what is not, that when something of the devil, something that's not of him, Tries to mess with me. And I've had to speak up and say, that's a curse. Christ redeemed me from the curse. Is God to blame for the evil things that take place in the world today? Being he is the creator of all, is he the one ultimately behind the creation of evil? In this new series by Stephen Frazier, the origin and author of evil, you will learn about the goodness of God the judgment of God, the chastening of the Lord, as well as the creation of darkness. To order the fourth CD teaching series, call 888-542-2555 or order online at lofbc.org. Life of Faith Bible Church. Join us Sunday mornings at 1045 a.m. and Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. For more information, visit us online at lofbc.org or call 888-542-2555. For a CD or DVD of today's message, write to us at Life of Faith Bible Church, 14200 Spiegel Lane, Louisville, Kentucky, 40299 or call 1-888-542-2555. You can also visit us online at lofbc.org.